Thank you, Heather. Um, let's just pray before we start. Lord Jesus, you are the word, and each word you speak has great significance. So as we listen to your words on the cross, help us to hear what they say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I was going to open this up to show you how long a sermon it's going to be. <laughs> um, I really enjoyed, oh, it won't shut now, look at that. <laughs> Oh, oh well. Uh, hold the edge. Oh yes, that's good. <laughs> I really enjoyed catching up on uh, Nick's sermon on YouTube um, last week. And Nick introduced to us the idea that the cross is not something God does to Jesus. It is something God does as Jesus. That Jesus is God and God has always been like Jesus. Now, in the second of this series, um, we, we've just listened to the reading, and we hear that when Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple he loved, he said to her, dear woman, and, and this is not uh, it, to be understood dismissively in Jewish, um, dear woman, here is your son. And he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from then on, his disciple took her into his home. I found preparing this talk uh, quite hard. On one level, it's very simple. It's a story of unselfish concern in a harshest place. But it's also a story of a goodbye, a son saying goodbye to his mother and to his best friend. And even though Jesus, as we know, is to rise from the dead, it'll never quite be the same. The old was ending, the new kingdom was beginning. It was time to say goodbye. I hate goodbyes. <laughs> For as long as I can remember, I've hated them. When I was five years old, um, my parents, who were missionaries, sent me from Indonesia, where they worked, to Malaysia, across the sea to boarding school. And from then on, I saw them twice a year, at most. The mission which advised them justified it using the words of Jesus, I assure you that everyone who's given up house or brothers or sister or mothers for my sake and for the good news will receive now and in return a hundred times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and property, along with persecution. I don't want to dive into that well this morning, <laughs> but I want to just describe a five-year-old's goodbye. Men with ornate batik sarongs are standing in the shade of the cars or lounging under the trees. In front of me, past a throng of luggage porters and confused passengers, stands the Maidan International Airport. It's not as grand as it sounds. The corrugated brick-red tin roof, it covers an oven, an oven full of thinly disguised chaos fanned silently from above by these fans that hardly move the air. I'm not ready to go in yet, nor are my family. The tarmac beyond the railings is shimmering with the heat, and my parents' eyes are shimmering too. The scene is almost silent for a moment, as though time has at once relented and stood still for half a second. And then the noise floods back the roaring hiss of jets warming up, the shouts of the porters and the passengers alike, car horns and in the distance, an ice cream vendor's bell. Into this clamor bursts the scream of a siren. The road over the runway is closing for an incoming jet. My dad's hand dwarfs mine. 
His face is line furrowed by bright sunshine, a wisp of thinning hair, sparkling eyes that radiate a gentle kindness. And he's recounting, telling me tales of when we used to play on that runway, firing an assortment of toy rockets and planes into the glorious open space. He seems to be speaking from a long way away. My brother puts his arm around my shoulders. It's time to go. The tarmac is still shimmering on the horizon, and I climb up the steps and wave one last time. Pooh Bear waves too. I guess he's hoping that we'll get a seat facing the departure gallery. There are other friends there, and I try to look brave, but my stomach is not as in pain. I cannot see them out the window. Yep, I hate goodbyes. So what did Mary, John, and Jesus make of this one? Mary was perhaps a teenager when Gabriel had called her favored woman, that she, a virgin, would give birth to a son and name him Yahweh saves or Jesus. Gabriel went on to tell her that he will be very great and will be called the son of the most high that God would give him the throne of his ancestor, David, and that he would reign over Israel forever. She had responded magnificently, believing what she was told, glorifying God in what we now understand to be the Magnificat. At Jesus' declaration, dedication in the temple, the elderly Simeon calls Jesus God's salvation prepared for all people, a light to reveal God to the nations, the glory of God's people Israel. But he warns her that many would oppose him. The deepest thoughts of many hearts would be revealed and a sword would pierce her very soul. At the age of 12, Mary, Jesus and Mary loses Jesus at the Passover festival and finds him in the temple, sitting among the religious leaders, listening and asking questions. With them amazed at his understanding and answers. On asking him, why have you done this to your parents? Jesus replies, why did you need to search? Did you not know I would be in my father's house? Such was the extraordinary nature of what Mary saw that 20 years later when Jesus was starting his ministry in Cana of Galilee and a wedding feast has run out of wine, she simply says to the servants, and despite his protests of it not yet being his time, do whatever he tells you. That's her confidence in her son. But things start to get crazy. Soon Jesus is in a house and the crowds are gathered in such numbers that he and his disciples are even struggling to find time to eat. Not all of the people are friendly and his family hear what's happening and try to take him away saying he's out of his mind. But they can't even reach him in the house, it's so full. And when told that they're there, he says, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And then anyone who does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Now Mary is standing with three other women. Her sister, also called Mary, and another Mary from Magdala on the seashore whom Jesus had cast out evil spirits from. And her son is hanging, nailed cruelly to a Roman cross. And he's dying. Where now is the Davidic throne? Where now is the eternal reign? 
Where now the glory of Israel? Darkness is descending. Her son Jesus is gasping for breath. Is Mary's confidence holding? Will he exert his royal power? If not now, when? We're not told, but I imagine Mary, indeed all the followers, are praying fervently. And then he speaks. But it's not a word to sweep away the Roman garrison. It's not a word to incinerate the mocking Pharisees. It's a word to her. Dear woman, here is your son. And to John, here's your mother. It's Jesus commending them to each other's care. It's goodbye. Jesus is surrendering himself to death. He's thinking of her even as it happens, but he's going to die. This is goodbye. Why? Why can he not be the one to care for her in old age? Why him, the one who would reign in Israel forever? Let's turn to John. John had met Jesus in depth much more recently. At least he may have had much earlier contact as a broader family member. But it was scarcely three and a half years since he'd sat mending his nets following a futile night of fishing. Do you remember the story of John meeting Jesus? This rabbi or teacher asked John's friend, Peter, to push the boat out so he can use it to preach. And on concluding the talk, Jesus tells Peter, push out and cast the nets once more. Suddenly, Peter is shouting for help. His nets are so full, they're tearing. And James and John have to rush their boat to the aid of Peter and, and fill bo both boats with fish. And at that point, Jesus calls John, along with Peter, to come and follow him. Immediately, we're told, he left his boat and Zebedee behind. Over the next three years, we pretty much know how John and Jesus interacted, because fortunately, we have John's gospel. <laughs> um, we know how he hung, they hung out together. Uh, but as the gospel was written long after the events, we don't actually know at what point John, in his friendship with Jesus, really began to understand who Jesus was. So he's writing the gospel from, with a lot of hindsight. It's certainly clear that from the moment Jesus turns water into wine at Cana in Galilee, John sees something extraordinary. The glory of Jesus, he later writes. And so John, in his gospel, takes notes of signs that are pointing to this greater reality that he's seeing. Wine at a wedding, turning water into wine at a wedding banquet, like inaugurating a new covenant. Cleansing the temple, throwing out the, the, the riffraff from the temple as its rightful heir, healing a lame man as Lord of the Sabbath, feeding 5,000 people as the bread of life. So John is pointing with these signs beyond what he's seeing to something that is amazing him. Walking on water as the Lord of creation, healing a blind man as he grants sight to the spiritually blind, raising Lazarus, from the dead as the giver of eternal life. So now, as Jesus takes each painful breath on the cross, his back flayed, his head pierced by a crown of thorns, how much of John's confidence in Jesus, the great I am, still holds? Where now are the angels that Jesus had told Nathanael would go up and down on the Son of Man, the stairway to heaven? 
where now this Messiah declared to a Samaritan woman at the well, the one of whom James and John's very mother had asked to grant places of honor, one either side of him when he came in glory. Where was that person? Where now the bread of life as Jesus himself is clearly dying? Where's the light of the world when darkness, we're told, had fallen across the land from noon until three o'clock as Jesus hung on the cross? Where's the resurrection and the life? Could John even remember those words that Jesus had said as Jesus' strength begins to fail? Or did he remember only Jesus' words in response to Mary when she poured this perfume over Jesus' feet and Jesus had said, leave her alone. She's done this in preparation for my burial. John is perhaps Jesus' most loved friend. They'd walked together, dined together, stuck together. Maybe even in his trial, we, we hear that there was one disciple who had access to the high priest's court, so maybe that was John. But even John cannot turn the tide of what has happened. And perhaps he's feeling shame that he couldn't do anything to save his friend. Perhaps he's feeling he's let Jesus down. Here he is, still standing by the cross. What pain and confusion. But Jesus is about to speak. Maybe now is the time. Here is your mother. We don't know why, when Jesus had brothers, John was asked to care for Mary, possibly as a nephew or something, it made sense. But more importantly, I think it was a practical task. It was a task, a duty to perform, something to take the mind off the baffling anguish of the scene. It was a gesture of kindness and love as a dying wish, the act of a real friend. So let's turn finally to Jesus. Jesus had grown up like any child. He had been swaddled in his mother's arms. He'd been instructed by homely routine. And it's his mother who sees first that his time has indeed come at Cana in Galilee. What a moment that must have been. And fully man now, yet also the visible image of the invisible God. Jesus begins to do the works the Father had given him to accomplish, performing miracles, speaking God's words. For God, we're told, had given him the Spirit without measure. He loves and he offers all who believe in him eternal life. It's really striking in John's gospel just how many times he offers eternal life. And he offers it to everyone. He offers it to tax collectors, to outcast Samaritan women, to lepers, everyday working people. This is the will of God, he says, that I should not lose even one of those who who's, he's given me. And hours before the cross, Jesus himself is stooping to wash the feet of these people who've gathered as his followers. He's an almighty God, and yet he's a servant king, humble and gentle at heart. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, he says, and I will give you rest. And what frustration he faced, too, with the Jewish leaders. Um, who should most have welcomed him, but it wasn't them that turned to him, it was, it was the others. He said to them, you search the scripture because you think it, they give you eternal life, but the scriptures point to me. Yet you refuse to come to me to get this eternal life. And later, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. It's a lonely road for Jesus. He was much misunderstood. 
more, he can see it coming. His hour. Early on, when meeting Nicodemus, he says, As Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. That's right at the start of his ministry. Gradually, the hour draws near. In the temple, he cries out, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for his sheep. And then, closer, now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter his glory. I tell you the truth, as long as a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. I think I've got that quote wrong, so just excuse me on that one. But now my soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? But this is the very reason I came, he says. Father, bring glory to your name. Even his disciples don't get it. At the Last Supper, he says over the bread, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And perhaps with a little exasperation at their failure to see the big picture. Now I'm going away to the one who sent me. And not one of you is asking where I'm going. Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. So he ends up alone in the Garden of Gethsemane. Prays with such an agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. And soon the blood is real, crowned with thorns, flogged to such weakness that another man has to be asked to carry his cross. Nailed to a rough wooden cross in a Roman execution. And as his breath begins to fail, one might think his t thoughts would turn to his plight. But no, he sees the anguish on his mother and his disciples' face. Standing defiantly by him, and he offers them consolation. Dear woman, here's your son. And to John, here's your mother. So, <laughs> I've no idea how I'm doing for time. Uh, but we're, what, what are we to make of these extraordinary words? I'd like to offer one or two concluding reflections. First, suffering here on earth is real. Goodbyes are real. Sometimes we face things that seem to make no sense. And God does not so stop the suffering or death. Many have, of you have faced or are facing that. Mary and John watched on as the one they most loved suffered and died. And it's not always possible to see the purpose in that moment. It sometimes doesn't look like it makes sense. We and they are often ignorant of God's real purpose, full purpose in earthly events. So if you're at that point, hold fast, <laughs> hang in there, don't abandon hope, don't let go of the faith that you hold of the existence and the goodness of God. Jesus' story frames a bigger picture. He shares our suffering and we can find peace in him. Here on earth, you'll have many trials and sorrows, he says. But take heart, because I have overcome the world. Secondly, I think uh, one of the important things is to um, grow in our faith and knowledge of Jesus together. You know, let's immerse ourselves in the Bible, not just a superficial understanding of, of, of the story of Jesus, but in the full narrative arc from Genesis through to Revelation, um, so that we can ourselves 
point people to that bigger narrative story of salvation and hope when they are suffering, when they're in those dark moments. So we can say to them, hold fast. Finally, I want to tell you, and I'm sure you know, that God notices and loves you. Not generically, not occasionally, but you, specifically you. With all your flaws, uh, all my flaws, <laughs> and in all your suffering, God knows you. Whether that suffering is external or self-inflicted, at the very moment that Mary and John had no reason to expect Jesus to notice them, it's then he looks up. He, his eyes lock on theirs. At the point of his own death in excruciating pain, he's noticing them. He's loving them. And that was when he was bound by the physical uh, of his humanly nature. God isn't dead, and he's looking at you. And he knows everything about how you're feeling, and he's longing to set you free from your suffering and shame. So let's cast ourselves on him. Uh, he's paid the price to set us free. Amen.